Okay, so welcome to, uh, to, to my session. This is uh, Is Your Profiler Speaking to You? Um, this is actually the first time I'm giving this session, so uh, I'd uh, much appreciate any feedback that you have about the session and the content. Um, my name's Simon Maple. A little bit about me. Uh, I work for Zero Turnaround. I'm a developer advocate for Zero Turnaround. I, I, I talk about JRebel and XRebel as our products. Um, I also help out a lot with uh, Geek Out Estonia, Geek Out EE. Anyone heard of Geek Out? Quite a few people. Okay, cool. We had one Geek Out UK conference. Anyone been to that? A few people. Awesome. And, um, and yeah, we'll probably be doing that again sometime, but we'll see. Uh, I'm also um, a Java champion, um, mostly for the work that I do with the Virtual Jug, which is an online-only um, uh, Java user group, um, which has been pretty cool. It's about 18, 20 months old now. Uh, we have just, over, just under 4,000 members. So if you wanted to look at that, go to virtualjug.com. Um, I'm also this little Duke dude with a guitar, means I'm a Java 1 rockstar speaker, which is kind of cool. Um, and I'm also uh, heavily involved with the LJC as a co-organizer. So I'm, I'm very much into my community, um, and, uh, and this is cool. So I'm going to be talking about profilers. Uh, one of the reasons I'm talking about that is because of a product that we have called XRebel, um, and which is a profiler. It's a, it's a fairly new profiler, maybe a year, just over a year old now. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to look at performance tools. Well, actually, you know, there, there are different combinations of performance tools that I'm sure you guys, some of you, are using now. Um, from APMs to profilers to, to things like that. We're going to just talk about what they are. Um, we're also going to look at some performance numbers. And these, by numbers, what I mean is we have a survey which we released uh, very recently, only a few months ago. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of results back about how people use performance in their environments today. And we're gonna, this is going to be an exclusive for DevOps UK. We're going to actually show you the, those numbers for the first time. These are actually the raw numbers. Um, we're also going to look at the difference between sampling and tracing and how different profilers do that. Um, and, and finally, give a little bit of demo about XRebel because very often um, profilers tend to run at the same time. Um, and there is a slight problem with that, but XRebel does things differently. So I'm going to give you a quick demo of XRebel as well. This is a, this is a, a screenshot of XRebel, just a teaser as to what you're going to see later. Um, but I'll talk about that in, in, in more depth as we, as we come. Anyone has any questions, please just throw your hand up or throw something at me and we'll, we'll go from there. So performance tools. Um, these can broadly be categorized in three different ways. Java monitoring tools, Java profilers, or Java testing tools. Um, so what are they? A Java monitoring tool um, is, the kind of, is the kind of tool which typically runs in its own process, monitors your entire environment, from your CPU to your memory to you know, threading to you know, all, all these different kind of things. You're looking at, you're, we're effectively talking about APMs here. Um, the answers which a Java monitoring tool or an APM will give you is, is my environment broken and where is it broken? It doesn't go into too much depth, but it will give you that kind of information. These are the kind of tools which you will typically run in your production or your staging environments where you actually have your entire environment running as, as you would expect in production. Now, a Java profiler will tell you more about what is wrong um, and sometimes even how you go about fixing it. So, once you know you have a problem, this is typically where you go into a where you use something more like a profiler, and you can kind of you know maybe trace through memory, th trace through uh, method calls and that kind of thing. And we've also got Java testing tools. So uh, you know many of you have probably heard of things like JMeter or, or Gatling and these kind of tools, which provide load into a system um, so that you can actually see how your system will run uh, in in a kind of production environment or under under load and stress. Um, and this this actually is really cool because it gives you the ability to benchmark. So you might be able to say, okay, here's my environment, here's my app. I'm going to run a Java test tool like Gatling or JMeter. I'm going to run you know, 100 threads with 20 requests at a time. Let's see how everything runs under stress. And then as I make my changes, I'll benchmark so I know my throughput. I can then make some changes, and then I'll rerun. It's really important to, to when you make a change, you test, you measure, and repeat. It's, there's no point in making your changes unless you, are, unless you are making sure that they are positive changes and they're not affecting your system um, adversely. So let's see how... Um, actually, we have actually released another. These are, these are kind of free reports that you, can, that you can download. In fact, Oleg, why don't you stand up? This is Oleg. Uh, Oleg works for Zero Turnaround as well. Um, he's, yeah, let's have a round of applause. Right, Nitsan, yeah. 
Um, Oleg works, uh, Oleg is the head of Rebel Labs and, and he, he's the guy to thank for all these cool free reports. Um, this, is a, this is a great report which, which Oleg and I wrote um, about performance, about, you can under, about how you can understand a lot of the background terms, um, as well as understand you know, which, application, which um, profilers, which APMs might suit you better. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, but I mentioned the survey that we released. Now, we released that only a few months ago. Um, and I'm going, to show you, I'm going to share with you now the results that we had. We had about just over 1,500 um, responses to that survey. Um, and here they are. I'm not sure if you can see this very well from the back, but I'll read it through. So most of the people here are going to be, most of the people that responded to us, 1,570, are technical people. Software developers, software architects, team leads, project managers. Uh, did I just call a project manager a technical person? Maybe, but hey. Um, so mostly technical people. Um, their applications were mostly web apps. A few desktops, um, some others, application servers, middleware, that kind of thing. Um, but virtually all web applications. So when do you test? When, does, when do people test here? Who tests in production? <laughs> Come on, that's what users are for, right? Who tests in development? Let's start there. Okay, quite a few people. And when I say development, are we talking like an end of registration build, that kind of stuff, on a, on a, on a key build? Both. Both. On your, on your so you do some desktop, and you do some... Okay. Um, here, what the results we see is most people actually test here in a kind of system integration test. So this is way beyond a developer putting their code in. Um, while you code, it was pleasing to see that. Um, again, in staging and production. In production here, I'm guessing this is kind of like just APM monitoring kind of stuff. Um, tools. Visual VM was top of our list, actually. Um, JProfiler, another really, really important one. It, custom in-house tools. I was really surprised that 20% of people use their custom in-house tools to actually test. Do people do that here as well? Is this, is this common? Who's got hands up if you do? Legacy. Legacy. OK, right, I see. Um, bash scripts. <laughs> Excellent. Good old bash. So, um, when, do, when do people find their bugs? Most of the time, it's actually in users. Users you know, suggesting that their application response times are slow. Um, a lot of the time, it's performance monitoring tools, as you expect, but still, the, the majority is, is, is that. And people are suffering from the slow request times. It's more people being annoyed at slow request times rather than outages. Um, and the root causes, it can be many things. Um, the biggest hitter, of course, is slow database queries, but this is kind of a specific part of I.O., right? A database query is just an I.O. call. Um, but the database always, everyone, any DBAs here? Good, aren't DBAs bastards, right? It's always the DBA. Um, so yeah, DBAs, inefficient application code. This is a simple fix, application, inefficient application code. Okay, unless, you're not, unless you want to be truly anal and, and, and go through, you know, make sure you're calling the right type of method and blah, 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 you know, there, are, there is a huge amount of inefficient code that can be fixed early that will hugely inc increase your, your, your performance time. Um, does it affect users? Yes, hugely affects users. This is so important to get this, to get this fixed early and fail early. So who are the heroes? Who do you think the heroes are in, in that, that fix performance style bugs? I'll tell you, it's not the DBA. <laughs> Developers. Developers, exactly. Irrespective of where it's found, I mean, you know, we, we were talking about people testing in, in system test, integration test, in production, but who fixes it? It's the developers, typically. Um, this was a multiple choice question. People could multiple answer questions, so yes, it doesn't add up to 100, but 94% of people who responded, um, developers are key to fixing that. But the problem with how we do performance testing now is a lot of the time we don't do our performance testing in development. Yet it's our developers that fix it. But we'll talk about that later. How often do people profile? It looks like there's a bit of firefighting here. When people see issues, they profile. If you don't know there's a problem, people just assume there isn't a problem until someone tells them. A lot of the time, that's just because you know, developers have their own schedules. Developers have plenty of pressures from other people. If something works, check it in. Okay, if it functionally works, check it in. Um, that's, that's the developer mentality a lot of the time. Performance test, that's a stage. It's very almost like waterfall model thinking. Um, so yeah, I mean, typically people are looking at around anything from, well, we're looking at mostly monthly application releases. Some people trying to be agile. Um, but really, 
even though that was the majority, here we have one to two days per release or no time at all in a release of performance testing and monitoring. And don't forget, a release here, we're talking months. Okay, so it really is. You know, what, you know when someone has a schedule and you say, I need this feature by then? And then people say, okay, I'll do, I'll do like 99% test, 99% development, and I'll just do that tiny bit of test at the end because some of my development's cool. Um, exactly the same thing's happening with performance. Performance, performance is sometimes a fatality of a release schedule. Um, did it work? Well, some people say marginally faster. A lot of people say it's 50% faster or above. And a worrying number of people don't know how to compare or don't compare. So what's the point of performance, doing performance testing and performance changes if you, can't even, if you don't even know whether you're actually benefiting? So what's the journey of performance? And every application that, that people are writing will have, this, will have this performance map measured out for them. Okay? It's, it's, it's trying to make what you've got go as fast as it can, trying to eliminate bugs and problems. Um, a guy called Alexei Shipilev, um, if you don't know Alexei Shipilev, you should follow him on Twitter, because he's, he's a super cool and intelligent guy, um, way more intelligent than me, working for Oracle. He actually did a VJUG session on memory, uh, Java memory model, um, and it was a really, really good session. Now, he, he, he drew this graph up on a whiteboard, which talks about the kind of phase diagram of performance testing, where your application goes um, from... In fact, let's, let's make this a little bit easier. There's a relationship between your complexity of your code and the performance of your code. And you, we kind of start here in A. Um, now, when we start, there are, there, are huge, there, there are a huge number of mistakes. And I know there's a whole bunch of prima donna developers here, I'm sure, that don't believe they make mistakes, but they do. And these, these mistakes can be easily fixed. And we can easily get to this position here, B, just by refactoring code, um, avoiding inefficient APIs, avoiding calling code too many times that you don't need to, all these little simple things that, after a few bits of refactoring, come into our code base. Once we, once we get to B, this is typically where profilers exist. Um, you, you, you know, look through your paths, you, you trace your methods, and you work out where you can, where you can optimize your code. Um, and this gets us to a kind of nice place where we're a lot more efficient, but our code isn't too complex. Okay? Now, from C onward, this is where dragons lay here. This is like the, this is like the real nasty hacking kind of point here. Um, and it's kind of like the last 5%, the last 1%. You really only go this far. I mean, th this is going to kind of get you hard to maintain code, but it's really going to get you to that point where if you're in a finance organization and milliseconds count, that's where you need to, to be. Um, so, you know, we start here, and we want to kind of end up maybe in and around C, depending on the requirements of our application. Um, so, when we talk about profiling, let's go into profiling a little bit more now. When we talk about profiling, there are two different things we can profile. There's CPU profiling or application profiling, depending on which level you're looking at. And there's also memory profiling. Um, now, this session, so CPU profiling is really talking about you know, optimizing your latencies in your applications, whereas memory profiling is more talking um, kind of like about you know, your memory usage and, and how that's going. They're two totally different topics, two totally different sessions. We're only focusing on the CPU profiling and specifically tracing and sampling. So high-level overview of tracing and sampling. Tracing is where you follow your method invocations of a request. So you're effectively following the flow. Whereas sampling is simply about aggregating stats of, of, a, of a snapshot. Let's talk about sampling. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do is let's, let's do something interactive. OK. If everyone could please stand up. This isn't going to be fun, by the way. It's going to be fun for me, but not for oh, you. Wait. Right. I'm going to get a panoramic shot. I want you to, everyone can do whatever they want, but just be absolutely still. You can do whatever you want. You can swear at me, but be absolutely still. Oh, that projector's nasty. OK, so what I did was I sampled. I took a sample of this entire audience. And you can, uh, actually, no, stay, stay standing. I took a sample of the entire audience, and everyone was still. So I got an absolute exact understanding of where everyone was at that time. Right, we're going to do this again. But this time, I want everyone to continually jump up and down. OK, so let's start. Everyone jumping up and down. I won't do it, actually. <laughs> OK, 
Okay. That's mostly awesome because no one outside, everyone outside this room has no idea what's happening. <laughs> okay. Um, so the different, what happened was then is the first time, I'm going to tweet this, the first time um, I took that photo, let's see if that works. The, fir the first time I took that photo, yeah, that looks, that looks kind of cool. Um, the first time I took that photo, oh, hashtag DevOps UK, you'll probably be able to see it in bigger than I would. The first time I took that photo, everyone was, everyone was still. So I got a consistent view of the JVM. The second time I took that photo, everyone was moving. You could have been threads in the JVM. I'm not getting a consistent view of the JVM. So we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But a performance expert will just say, yeah, just take a, just take a, just take a dump. You know, there's a control break on Windows or kill minus three on any Unix kind of environment. And you'll get a dump. You'll see where all the threads are. You'll see what's happening. And there'll be a huge amount of information that, that, that you know, Regular developers like you and I will just not really understand or, or know which bit to look at. Um, we look at something like uh, your kit, which is a great, great profiler. Now, your kit is sampling here. Your kit has two modes. It has a sampling mode and it has a tracing mode, actually. But what we're saying is, I want you to sample every 20 milliseconds. Um, and I want you to sample here, the, the sample counts four. So basically, you, as you, you, while you were a, a JVM and you were all jumping up and down with different threads and resources, what I was asking you to do is stop, and then I take a quick sample. And what we did here was we did that four times, and it, was, it happened every 20 seconds. So every 20 milliseconds. So four times I got a complete view of the JVM and what was happening. I can then get stats from that. I can aggregate my stats, um, my, my stats from that and estimate how much time was being spent in each, in each method. And I can, get a, I can measure, you know, as long as this is done many, many times, I can guesstimate and measure how much time is being spent in various methods. Okay? It's not exact, but if we, increase our, if we increase our sample count by decreasing our sample interval, so before we were 20 milliseconds, now our sample interval is one millisecond, we'll get a huge number of sample counts. Um, and as a result, this is going to be, this is gonna be a, lot, uh, a lot more accurate. And you'll notice right at the bottom here, we have a your kit package, okay? And that's because samplers often sample themselves as well, which is kind of fun. Um, they happen to be on the stack at the time. They do work. Their profiles aren't free. They do work. And, and it happened to be on the stack, and so it got captured. So what is sampling then? Here we have, here we have our method flow. We have four methods. We start in main. We make an invocation to foo. We make an invocation to bar, and then up to baz. Okay, this is our method flow. Sampling occurs whereby we stop the JVM at certain points and we gather information about those points. We can't just choose which points, which points, we, um, which points we, we want to pick. As a result, you'll notice that the BAS method here is never actually sampled. If this ran for ages and ages and ages, then yeah, it might, it might, we might hit on it at one point. But in this case, we never actually sample that we hit the BAS method. Um, one other thing is, is safe points. Who's heard of safe points in Java? A few people. OK. A safe point in Java is where the world stops. Where I told you everyone to stop, that was, that was effectively a safe point of this room. OK. Th quite a few things happen in safe points. When garbage collection occurs, that happens at a safe point. Um, people may hear of um, GC pauses. That is where the entire JVM pretty much stops because garbage collection is happening. This is also a safe point. Um, so we can't, if we, if we don't have a safe point on this point here, we can't, we can't do a, 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 a sample on it. We have to keep our samples at these safe point moments. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's absolutely non-deterministic. We can tame it in some points, though. There's something called Java Mission Control. How many people use Java Mission Control? Check it out. It's, it's, it's just a JMC command. Um, and it actually gets shipped with the JVM since like Java 7, so yeah, 7 update 35 or something like that. Um, so yeah, it comes with the JVM. It's there for you to use. And it's actually got a really, really good UI. It's a nice little dashboard. Um, and you can see a whole bunch of different things. Um, honest, uh, actually, it uses a proprietary API as well. Oh, in fact, it says it there, 740. Um, it uses a proprietary API as well, so it actually can avoid safe points. So it gets a, it gets a, you know, a, a better view of the environment. Also, there's something called Honest Profiler as well, uh, which is something which Richard Warburton um, has helped develop. Uh, and uh, this uses uh, another workaround to actually avoid safe points. 
But largely, um, as far as sampling profilers go, uh, you're going to hit safe points. So this is um, Java Mission Control. Um, very often, you get kind of two different views of profilers, which is one of the reasons why we introduced Xrebel. And the two different views are you get very little information, or you get loads and loads of information. So here, we have very little information. We have, we have it by package. And here, we can see Java Util is hot. Now, I wouldn't call myself a performance expert, but I'm going to know that Java Util is going to be hot, right? Everyone uses Java Util. We're going to spend a lot of time in there. Yes? I was wondering about these sampled profilers. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a great question. Uh, so the question was, if, uh, if, uh, if, if the JVM inlines a method, um, will, 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 it be, uh, will the profiler mark that method as being the, the inside that method? Now, I guess it depends on the, on the individual profilers and when the instrumentation gets, gets made. Um, I'm ex I think because the instrumentation will... In, 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 instrument yes, that's a good point. Um, that's a good point. Do you know that? Yeah, Can I help, you out? Yeah, help me out. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it'll show up in the profile if after inlining you still have a save point in there. Uh, so the sort of save point bias uh, profile is the common profiler. Uh, a method that gets inlined often loses the save point that it has at method exit. Uh, so sometimes inlining a method makes it completely uh, invisible. But generally, the JVM has all the debug information it needs to tell you about inline methods as well as normal methods. Which is the same way it kind of does the debugging as well. Yes. Um. So basically, we want to say, OK, this is great, but can you tell me some more, please? I need to know. I need to go deeper into this. Um, and then you go deeper into it and, it, and it, and it gives you so much information that you're kind of like, well, yeah, but you know, how about no? I need to. I need to have information, particularly as a developer, that I can understand. I, I, I don't want to use a profile or a performance tool if I need to be an expert, because we're not going to get a world where all our developers are experts in, in performance tooling. OK, so now let's go over to tracing. Um, so tracing with instrumentation. Um, so here we have our business method. Um, and I expect all business methods to be called business method. Um, we're going to instrument at the start and at the end, um, basically just hitting our current time in milliseconds, we log when we start, we log how long it's taken, and that, that's, effectively, that's effectively what you know, tracing does. It marks at the start and the end of a method how long have you spent in that method. Um, we can do this, instead of, instead of current time millis, we can do this in nano time. Um, it gives you a more precise um, time in more, in more detail, um, but of course with everything it's going to be less performant, it's going to take you more time to get that information. Um, the other thing, of course, we can do is we can create our nice old API. So we say profiler.start, business method, and so forth, and then add that in a finally so it always gets called. A um, little bit of sugar. Now, we've got a couple of ways we can do this. We've talked about nano time. We've talked about current time millis. Depending on what you want to use, if you, if you really care about the, the absolute nanosecond time, then you go for nano time. There's a, there's a problem with nano time, though, um, and that problem is it is slow, and there's also a lot of contention on nano time. If you have multiple threads all accessing nano time at the same time, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna actually see a big performance problem. Um, current time millis doesn't suffer from that, but you're not going to get the exact detail as well. Um, one of the ways that we looked into it, and other profilers do as well, is to have this parallel thread. So you've got a parallel thread which is constantly running and constantly using nano time. Um, but because there's no contention on that, because there's only one thread, um, it, it's, it's a lot cheaper to use. And then all our other threads can access this parallel thread pretty much just saying, can you grab me the current time? Can you grab me the current time? Can you grab me the current time? Um, there are a few different ways of using this, using this, um, this, this parallel thread. We can either do a sleep wake up. We can have a yield wake up. Um, so the thread yields at certain times. Or we can have a busy loop. But we know busy loops often can be CPU intensive. Um, so let's have a look at our profiler. Here's our profiler. We have, uh, we have a loop here. Um, and this loop is effectively going to be running in our, in our separate thread. And periodically, when we call start in our profiler, 
um, all we do is we go, to this, we go to this separate thread and we just ask the time from it. Um, the actual busy loop itself, uh, in our run method, so this is a, this is a separate thread, runnable thread, um, in our run method, all we're doing is in our while loop, we're getting the time and we're sleeping. Um, fairly straightforward. One thing that we absolutely need to be clear about here, though, is, is reading memory is not free, depending on where you are in the stack as well. Um, the, you know, we need to effectively grab some clock cycles. We need to understand the clock time. Um, so we need to go quite deep to understand that. Uh, there's a great, great blog. It's a long blog, but it's a great read called Nano Trust in the Nano Time. And this is by Alexei Shipilev again. Um, and he, and he, he does a whole bunch of benchmarking on, on nano times. In fact, let's have a look at this. Um, so this is split by operating system. So we have Linux at the top, then Solaris, then Windows. Um, the latency nano time is uh, the amount of time it takes for the JVM to actually achieve, you know, get back a, a, a time, a nano time. So here on, on Linux, it's taking 25.524 nanoseconds, plus or minus this, um, to actually, from the call of get, get nano time, to, to, to re return that. The granularity is how long it takes the system to generate its next nano time. So how long will it be? How long will I have to wait before another nano time is available for me to get from the system? So when we look at Linux and Solaris, those numbers look reasonable-ish. But when we look at Windows, while it's cheaper to get the nano time, it takes a long time for the next step for that system nano time to change. So a couple of things that, that are worth looking at. And um, this is, for those of you who want more information, this blog is well worth checking out. This one? Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, the, the, yeah, all, all four of these should be, uh, should be dots. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, that's uh, European dots. <laughs> OK, sleep times. This is, an, this is another thing which is very interesting. Um, if, I was to say, if I was to say sleep for one millisecond, what am I actually going to get back? On Windows, um, you're looking at around, this is a minimum sleep time of 1.7 milliseconds. Linux, minimum of uh, 0 0.1 milliseconds. OS X, 0 0.05 milliseconds. So they're not necessarily too reliable. VirtualBox and Linux, yeah, that's, that's not a good combination. You're looking at kind of like, 10 seconds or over, that's, that's not great. Um, yield also has its problems. So basically, you know, this isn't a clean thing. Yield, if you have CPU starvation on a Windows machine, you're not guaranteed to ever get yielded. So we have some big, big problems using, using yield on a, on a Windows machine. Um, so how are we going to implement our busy loop then, knowing that? Well, we have our volatile time. We have our, we have our run, which does a sleep. Basically, what we can do is we just say, well, we're going to yield unless this is a Windows machine because we can't trust that Windows machine. OK, moving on to tracing. Um, so tracing, yeah, instead of, instead of like these arrows that drop down at certain points that are non-deterministic, what we actually do is we say, I can choose every single point which I want to trace. So I know exactly when I'm in a method, exactly when I'm out a method. Now, this is obviously going to be less performant than sampling. Okay, because every single invocation of a method, you're going to take a hit. And in fact, if we look at these, if we consider these circles to be the amount of time that, that is spent in the methods, um, you can see this is the amount of time spent dur during, the, uh, during the trace, the instrumentation. This is the amount of time actually calling business logic. If you actually look here at Baz, while we get into Baz, the actual time it takes to um, instrument the, the, the capture of the time is longer than it takes to actually run the business method. Short methods do struggle with instrumentation. Um, and sometimes profilers will kind of just say, I'm going to count the number of times I go into these short methods. Um, a lot of the time, optimizers try and, uh, optimizers, profilers try and optimize how they access these methods to try and take out their own profiling bias. Um, so yeah, let's have a look at the, this kind of profiling bias. Here we have this main method, which calls foo, bar, baz. And you notice every single time we make an invocation, we're going to get a delta, which is the time it takes for us to instrument. Uh, this is fine, but you know, if we add another, if we add another, uh, another branch here, the boo method, we only get one, one single 
um, delta. Whereas over here, we've actually got four combined together. So there's a balance shift where you ha when, as and when you have two branches as to how much additional delta will get added on that. Um, some, um, some profilers will add these, will actually calculate these deltas and remove them from. Um, so for example, here, it's actually kind of like, you know, removing uh, number of, a number of nanoseconds based on, on how much the, 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 the profiler has had to instrument and go through its own code. Um, but you know, the big question here is, is this important? Do you really care about a, 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 you know, a millisecond level? Or are you really interested in the order? You know, how, how, you know, is, this a, is this a point or a case where I even need to care about it? Or do I need to care about it? That's the kind of, that's the kind of difference. Um, so yeah, some people care about that, some people don't. Um, OK, this is interactive now. So what else, what else might you consider as an area which you want to, which you want to you know, profile or performance areas in your environment? So for example, it might be we've had database access. What else, what else in the room uh, are, you, are you monitoring? Shout out. Calls to other services. Calls to other services. So, so web services or third parties, yep. Anything else? Threads, number of threads, thread pools. GC time, yeah, GC time, and this is really about the GC pauses. Um, you know, how long, how long is that? How long are you in that safe point for? Um, are you doing GC too much? Is the is, are the pauses too long? That kind of thing. Anything else? Do you do you ever profile memory footstamp? You do. You can profile memory. Yeah, that was the. That's another session. But memory is absolutely something you can profile. Yeah. So here's, here's some options. Um, we talked about third-party components. We talked about database access, web services, um, <laughs> caches. Are you using your caches? Are your caches effective? HTTP sessions. This is another one for session bloat. Are you putting too much in your HTTP sessions? Developers tend to love sticking stuff in HTTP sessions because it's easy. But it's not always, you know, if every developer did that, you'll have huge session bloat. Uh, we talked about GC as well. So what questions should you be asking about your environment? What questions do you ask about your application? How fast is my web service responding to requests? Okay, how fast? So latency, we're talking kind of the latency of, of, of web services. That's a, that's an important one. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Transactions per second. Transactions per second. Your throughput. What about what about slightly lower level on the inside the transaction? What do you care about? It's too slow. What do I need to change? Right. And databases, database connections, how many SQL queries you're making, how long those SQL queries last. Um, here are some examples. Um, we talked about external calls as well, the kind of things that are outside of your hands. You can only do so much, but if your external calls are taking too long, that's something that absolutely needs to be considered. So this is the curve. And really, this is the kind of area that can be improved most, but it's often the area that is not really looked at till much, much later. Typically, profilers tend to work around the kind of, the kind of BC area, um, but what I want to do is I want to now focus on how we, can improve, how we can improve this. And the way to improve this is to fail fast and fail early. As a developer, I don't want to have to write all my code and then you know, pass it on, pass it, pa pass it on, until some performance person says, well, actually, you've got a bug here. Okay, I want to fail fast while I'm writing that code. And now I'm going to show you a quick demo, uh, as we're coming up to close to the end, of Xrebel um, and how Xrebel does this. So uh, any other questions before I jump into that? OK. So. Let's look at Xrebel. Oh, I'm speaking soon. Excellent. There we go. So um, here I've just got a pet clinic application. <laughs> Let me fix that. Well, you can't see my screen. Mm -mm -mm. Oh no. OK, so we have that, and we have that. So let me make this bigger. That's weird. Uh, 
not strange. There we go. Cute little dog in cat. Right, so this is, uh, I, I've just replaced Josh Long so on this stage, so I'm going to talk about spring, um, just, just in, his, in his absence. So this is, the, this is the spring pet clinic sample. I'm sure most people have seen this, right? Quite a few, a lot of nodding heads. Um, so what we've basically done is we've taken this sample application uh, and we've injected Xrebel into it. Xrebel it works uh, as it's, you know, it's an instrumenter. It traces. Um, so, is that right? Actually, it is, an, it is a trace, isn't it? Yeah, it's a trace. <laughs> I have to ask. Um, it's a tracer. So basically, we, we instrument different methods to say when we enter and when we exit, method, uh, exit methods. What, one thing we also do is we instrument um, at the data source level. So we understand exactly uh, how much uh, database I.O. is happening and how many actual SQL queries um, get created. Uh, who uses Hibernate here? Loads of people. Uh, keep your hands up if you use Hibernate. Keep your hands, and then put your hands up as well if you use um, uh, JPA. Right, loads of people. Keep your hands up if you think a single JPA query or Hibernate query equates to a single SQL query. Exactly right. One line of Hibernate or one line of JPA in your code isn't going to equate to one line of 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 SQL, and I'll show you that. Actually, I'm not sure if this is an a JDBC example, but I'll show you how that's possible. Um, so, okay, all I've done here is just add uh, in my Eclipse environment. Wow, that's pretty uh, pretty small. In my Eclipse environment, um, I've literally gone to my run configuration. I have a Tomcat server here, and all I've done is added um, xrebel.jar. Can you see that at all? No, let me change the resolution. Here's a little trick. When you when you when you click on scaled, if you don't see what you if you don't see the option you want, click Alt Scaled, and it gives you all options. A little trick for free there. Okay, that better. Okay. Chrome. Whoa. That's better. Right, so now you can see this, um, this Java agent, which I'm adding. So I'm actually just attaching a Java agent to my runtime. And this allows Xrebel to get deep into the, into the runtime and instrument code. Um, that's all I've done. And the next time I actually run my application, I'll see, I'll see this toolbar, which sits in my, in my uh, response object. And now, this, this actually gets integrated with your application response. This is not. Um, a widget on the browser or anything like that. So as soon as you attach that uh, Xrebel jar to your to your runtime, you'll see this on your on your application request. Now, if I was to click around, this would this um, widget will just kind of sit here happily until I click something which it's not happy with, like this, for example. So this single amount of this short amount of data here, um, what's that? Ten rows or so? One, two, three, four, five, six, it's about ten rows um, has created. 37 SQL queries, and I can dig into that, and I can click through, and you'll, you'll notice at the top here, we'll view SQL, no SQL, or web service calls as well, so you can decide which you want to um, look at. Now, if we look down on this, we can see exactly, exactly where we're calling, and we don't show you all the information, we just show you the information that's relevant to you, and I can, I can see information uh, that is gathered from uh, the database, so I can see that uh, this JDBC template here on find owners. Um, this creates one SQL query uh, from the table owners. And we get whole, this is a pet owner, right? So we get a whole bunch of information about our pet owner, including at the very, very top, the ID of that pet owner. Um, what we then do, and this is JDBC, so this, in this example, we're going to go through probably like a, a for loop or something like that. We, we look in our pets database and we get loads of information about our pets based off of our pet owner ID. Now, if we look here, we'll notice on the right-hand side that our owner, when we actually made this SQL query to get all the owners, we notice that 10 rows are returned. As a result, we will make 10 SQL, further SQL queries based on those results. So I'll get, let's say I'll get um, you know, three owners 
back from my initial query. Owner Liz, owner Shana, owner, owner Oleg. What I'll then do is I'll make another request to the pets database and I'll say, send me all the information about the pets that Liz owns. That's one, another SQL request. All the pets that Shana owns, all the pets that Oleg owns. This is called an N plus one issue, whereby our one is our initial request, and our N, which is the, the, the further amount of, of SQL requests, is based on how many rows we get back from our first response. N plus one issues are super common with JPA, super common with Hibernate. Um, and th this is one of the major problems which developers don't often pick out. This could be like one or two SQL queries with a, with a, with a simple join or something like that. But very often, a developer will write some code. It works. They get the response back. Let's move on. Um, Anything else I want to talk about on this? So yeah, you get you t it tells you how much how much time is spent uh, in each in each SQL query. It tells you how much data you get back from it, and we also group um, SQL queries and let you know if there's a if there's a common a common theme to why we group that. Um, also, if you wanted. Uh, to go to the queries view, you can just view by all queries. Um, you can choose to you know, view on your time. Uh, you can choose to s sort on your table, depending on, depending on exactly what you want. So there's different ways you can, you can view this information. Any questions yet? Yeah. How is this actually working? I mean, uh, you get that little widget at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So on every, on every request, every HTTP request that goes through, we'll intercept that request. Um, we'll add HTML and JavaScript into the response object of that request. So the browser, so effectively, you know, you have, this is just like a layover, which we're adding into the code. So if I was to go, if I was to look onto this actual HTML, um, inspect element, actually, let's do it on this one. Uh, in the body. Here we go. This is like this this div extra pages here, um, and this iframe and stuff like that. It, it effectively just adds a little bit of HTML, a little bit of JavaScript into the request, and the browser just the browser just views it. So it's it's all about that um, that that widget that that uh, agent that that gets added. Yeah. It's a real obvious question. What if there is no web interface on my application? If there's no web interface on your application, then you go over here and you type extra and let me just clear this. This is called a uh, ninja UI, and you can see the little ninja there. Now, this little dude, he'll sit there in the background, and when you make requests, so for example, uh, RESTful, RESTful web service requests, um, you run them obviously in the background, the command line, and then you'll see these, uh, you'll see it uh, update here, um, and then you can go in and, and, and view them as well. What if my application uh, is on a firewall server? Between your development environment and your, um, so all this is all this is going uh, 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 all this is going through HTT. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure that will work with Extra or with Ninja. It's the same server that serves the It's it's yeah. All of it's all of it's going through port 80, um, which will which will be available anyway. Um, No, this is this is purely only. So the question was, what kind of overhead does it have? It does have overhead. It does have a higher overhead than than a lot of um, a lot of kind of tools that you would use in production. Because this is a pure development environment, um, we don't we're not as we're not you know as focused on tuning it for performance as if it was for a, a production environment. Um, it will have it will have an overhead, particularly on startup. But obviously, if you're using Jarable, that's not going to be a problem too much. Um, but but yeah, it will have kind of like I think it's like around a 50% startup overhead or something like that. Um, when you're actually once you're actually running, it's not actually too bad. We we do put a lot of um, optimizations in. But yeah, this is this is purely only for performance, uh, purely only for development. Um, the idea is fail early in development, so use this for development. We would recommend that you would use another tool in your pre-production pre -production or production to to kind of to get those problems, because we're not trying to find all the problems with this tool. We're just trying to find the, the, the simplest problems which don't need to go beyond development. Any other questions? 
Okay, um, one other thing that I'm going to show you is something that was actually added in Xrebel um, 2.0. So if I was to run that again, let's say, um, here we have what's called our application profiling. Um, and we call it application profiling because it's not really CPU profiling. We're not, we're not profiling the entire CPU. We're just profiling how, uh, how much time our application spends on that CPU. So here, um, you can see um, we have, uh, we have our, our, our HTTP GET. If I open that up, it, this is the cumulative time spent in this invocation. So we start at 100%, and as we go down the stack, um, we get we get lower and lower, and, and again we don't show you everything. We we remove we remove the pieces which are like negligible performance, so you can actually see. Because one of the one of the things is we want to make sure that this is a developer's tool. We don't expect developers to be you know full performance experts. So we try and we try and give you a UI um, whereby you can pinpoint the parts which are taking the time, and we do that um, by highlighting. So in this case, um, we have this JDBC template uh, prepared creating prepared statements, which is taking seven percent. And we have this kind of like blue, yellow, red um, traffic light system, whereby if something's red, it's taking, I think, over 30% of your time. If it's yellow, it's between 10 and 30 or something like that. So you can find your bottlenecks very, very quickly without being an expert. Um, so here, OK, some JDBC stuff, JDBC stuff. Um, if, there, if there was a problem, you'd be able to see it straight away. It would, it would flash up to you. Um, and that, that was something that was added in, uh, in, in, version, in version 2. Um, another thing is session data. So if I was to add some session data here, let me click Add Owner. Simon, let's just say Simon Maple for now. If I add that and nothing else, we'll see our session data increases. And you can see that's increased uh, by 152 bytes. Our current session size now is 264 bytes. Um, and this is, only, this is only taking into account like, kind of the last action. Because this is purely from a developer's point of view. What did the developer last click on? Let's let's see the difference. Um, if I click open this, we can actually see what's in our session. So we can say we have a first name and a and a, and a last name. It's added an address, which is interesting, at 40 bytes. Um, and our first name and last name is both 56 bytes. Um, if I was to if I was to make a change there and just delete that, click add owner. Let's see what let's see what that does. There we go. There we go. So last name has dropped by 56. Our overall has dropped by 56. Everything else is even. So you can actually see the differences that you're making based on your actions. And if, if there is a problem, as and when there's a problem, so for example, if I considered, if I changed my threshold of XREBEL to say, actually, I don't want my session size to ever increase over a request. Um, Oh, it's gone to minus. That's right. That's why I didn't like it. Uh, if I if I change this now back to Maple, all of a sudden that's a problem. It's highlighted it as a problem. So you can change your threshold based on your application. All applications are different. You know, if I if I go to if I go to Jira and I create a single Jira, I know that's going to create me. I think it's almost 200 SQL queries in the background. 200 SQL queries to create a Jira. That might be acceptable. It might not be. It all depends on the web app. So here in the thresholds, you can, you can set that. So I might say, do you know what? I'm going to put this back to 200. I don't want that to be a problem. As soon as I save it, it's no longer a problem in my, in my toolbar. Um, hidden exceptions. These can be a pain. Let's go, let's go to some code. Let's add owner validator. Here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an exception when we validate, uh, when we validate that form. I'm going to create a new exception. Um, and let's just throw it, actually. Let's just throw a new exception. So that's going out to the, um, uh, what's wrong? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, that's not, that's not hidden at all. I'm throwing it, aren't I? Print stack trace. So I'm going to create an exception. I'm just going to print it out. Hidden exception. Something that clogs up the uh, system out. You know when you go to, you know when you have a problem in production and you look through your code, you look through your system out, and 95% of it is just bullshit, like, like stack traces and stuff. And you think, where am I even looking for for, for this problem? Um, if I was to now rerun this, JRebel JRebel is reloading this code. A um, couple of things. Interestingly, we uh, it, it took a, a little bit longer to run that one, probably because of the the reload. Um, this time. Uh, here I can see my exception. I can see exactly where it's running, um, even though, oops, even though everything's running and, and nothing comes back to the to the user, you, it, it will tell you where this hidden exception is. So if something gets caught and not thrown, it's a hidden exception. That kind of stuff. Um, 
So that's everything I had to uh, offer. We have, it's, it's red. I have one minute left. That's pretty good timing. Um, any questions on XRebel or what I've uh, talked about in our session today? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, can, with XRebel specifically? So the, so the question is, can you, can you integrate XRebel with continuous testing uh, or uh, like a CI server, I guess? Um, now, currently, you can't do that. Um, it's, it's been very, very focused to a developer, a developer flow, a developer process, and adding this into the developer process. We want to we push it as far left as we can so that you know, um, rather, than, rather than have a separate team doing this or something like that, we want the developer to do it on their machine. It is something we have had many requests for, so it's something we are, we are looking at seriously as a feature, possible feature, um, but we can't, say, we can't say yet whether that's something we'll, we'll do. But yeah, thank you for the question. Any other questions? So, yeah. You had that block of code where you're measuring the time the method's taking. Mm -hmm. Do you want to bring that slide up? This one? Mm, I think there's another one. Oh, it's, uh, I know the one you mean. I think the previous one, yeah. Mm, this one? Yeah, that, so this is this how in concept J profilers, the your profilers measuring the, the time? Yeah, in, in, con in, in concept, this is, this, is how, this is how a lot of the profilers will instrument their code. Um, and typically, typically they, will go to, they will go to their kind of parallel thread and do that. Is that a right way to do it, though? Because if there's a pause <coughs> between the method finishing, before the exit of the method and the method finishing. Like a, like a safe point a safe point pause or something like that, or GC pause, GC whatever, pause. the CPU acting up or whatever, because mm -hmm. that will get accounted into, and it mm -hmm. probably might just, might just happen erratically, mm -hmm. and probably get accounted into the, uh, I think Gil has a talk on this called coordinated permission. Mm -hmm. Is your profile or other profile? So I'm not sure if Xrebel is doing that. I mean, I, I, I'd, guess, I'd guess this is when you get a safe point pause or something like that. Yeah, you'd you'd be able to, a profiler would be able to remove remove the times for 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 GC pauses and things like that from. Normally, if you have this kind of code, um, unless the save point happened while you're doing doing work, it's going to be completely removed. But normally, for profiling, we, we care about uh, throughput, not so much about latency. So you want to know where where the time is spent, and save points. Doing here. Yeah, and a, and a lot of stuff in it. And, and that's why that's why a lot of profilers try and take themselves out of that as well. They try and they try they effectively try and measure how long People they're sitting out of the method and measuring the method. I don't know how you do that. Mm. Then, well, I mean, a, uh, one one, one option is if you I mean this is this is really going to be negligible if the if the method is long, but if the method is short. Okay. Yeah. So sorry. We're, uh, let, let's talk about this afterwards. But, um, but if there are also lots of methods, and you're doing this. Then yeah. Exactly. If you have lots of mini methods, yeah. but anyway, thank you for coming, and uh, thank you.